now we've got Professor Wilhelm Schäfer, another German, Vice President of Research at the University of Paderborn and Executive Director of the RailCab project. Rail cabs, that's what we want to hear about. I don't know if you've ever taken trains in this country, but um, I think British people would be delighted to have um, good train transport on demand that worked on schedule and um, you know, didn't break down all the time and was affordable and all that. Anyways, um, <laughs> tell us about them. What is it? Part airport mover, driverless, taxi service type trains that we can see across countries? Yeah, actually, uh, that's a very well-placed comment. Even the German railway system is deteriorating. And uh, I don't see that much difference between England and Germany. And I've taken English trains, and English trains a number of times. Uh, so let me talk about uh, <clears throat> what we have in mind. And at the f uh, reading, I should just uh, make a disclaimer. I think compared with the other projects, we are still very much at research stage. Um, but still, I think we have something to offer. First thing is that this uh, rail cap company we created about five years ago is so far basically a, a, a company which has been created by the, by the principal investigators of the project, namely by my colleagues and myself, uh, to offer some possibilities for investment. And um, the difference to many other projects is that we have a truly interdisciplinary team, namely from mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and software engineering, which I am a part of. Uh, and that's very different from many other of these engineering projects in Germany and I think around the world. And you will see in a second, I think, why that is important. Second thing is um, about uh, the vision of the project. Uh, what we really target is uh, uh, different from what you know from, let's say, these traditional people movers. And actually, there's a, a very nice system at Heathrow. Uh, recently installed and we talked to the people who built the system at Heathrow and they visited us, we visited them. So I'm very well aware of what's going on, but what we target is really long distance traveling. And long distance traveling, of course, then neatly uh, comes together with short distance traveling. But the key thing is really to take the advantages already existing in basically railway traffic, despite the problems we just mentioned, which is really, to some extent, energy efficiency. Many people in one car and a lot less energy wasted than when you drive with your own car, uh, stand in a traffic jam for a long time, uh, in addition, the cars are very heavy, by far too heavy for what you want to achieve. They are basically heavy because you want to be safe in terms of crashes or in cases of crashes. So all this waste energy, right? Still, people like to use cars for obvious reasons. Very comfortable, easy to get to, easy to get in, take all your luggage in, whatever you can think of, right? So uh, how can we combine those things? And first of all, I'll give you an idea of how the scenario looks like. Small caps, that's where the name comes from which run on demand rather than on schedule. They are available 24 hours, seven days. They run driverless. You don't need a driver who is operating them. And you can change them easily between cargo and passenger rail cabs. And you can have different versions of these cars. Uh, you see on the right side for passenger comfort traffic or less comfort traffic, like this picture reminds you probably the London Tube. Um, and then you see in the middle, the key thing is those cars com, form convoys on long distances. And that saves energy because the windshield factor is taken into account. That's one key thing. They run touchless, so they can split off and can run to the destination you want to go, right? And as I said, you get them on demand rather than on a schedule. Final thing is you can reuse existing tracks, so that's really an existing track system, with the difference that you have a linear engine in the middle, put in in the middle, so it's basically a magnetic train but not elevated. And that brings me to the technology. Here we are. That uh, gives an idea of the key technological parts, and I don't want to go about all of them, but one key thing is this uh, so-called uh, track guidance model module, which are two different, uh, different independent axles which can be steered independently. And that really makes up for this loss of energy compared with the magnetically elevated trains. They run friction-free very fast. That was one of the reasons why they were invented, and this friction freeness can now basically be achieved, not complete, but almost, by smart mechatronics, as we call it. So basically what we do is we have wheels equipped with sensors, and those sensors measure the distance to the tracks, and then they are accurately steered in such a way that they don't have any friction anymore with the tracks on the side, so only on the ground, right? And that is a key thing for achieving energy efficiency, and of course also helping to, aware, uh, to avoid 
aware of the physical components. So two key things which also come with magnetically elevated trains, but of course for magnetically elevated trains you have to build all new tracks and you cannot reuse things and a lot of other problems. So this is more than a dream and just on paper and now I go back and now we could show the video. So this is our test track which runs on campus or which exists on campus and you can see two two small cars now in the scale of 1 to 2.5. You can still not ride on them or you're very brave. Uh, second thing is, um, so I have to, yeah, this is the test track from an aerial view, gives you an idea with the stator in between and there is the car, how it looks uh, as a technology car and here's just an idea of uh, how big the track is and how, scar how fast the cars are currently. So basically we run up to almost 40 kilometers per hour currently. So, final thing is um, there is a simulator built scale of one to one, so you can now walk in it and you can get the feeling of, of being run in it. I had a video as well for that, but that doesn't work, fortunately. So that people also get an experience of what it means sitting in a car without a driver and then being merged into a convoy, right, with a speed which sort of looks like you need a driver. But of course, what I'm always telling is when you run, or when you fly, you also think the pilot is in control, but in most cases the software is in control. Right? It's just phys mm. psychologically different in the sense that uh, you can see it directly, whereas in planes, of course, there's some distance between you and the cockpit. Final slide, uh, some calculations about comparison with existing systems. Uh, with a convoy of four trains or four cars, you are actually as efficient as a fully occupied ICE or France Rapide. And as you can get, Usually the cars or the convoys are longer than four cars when you travel long distance. There are a lot more cars which basically take the same direction. And of course, usually ICEs especially are not fully, fully occupied. So basically the, the graph opens up like a scissor and actually in our favor, right? Can we, can we wrap it up? Brilliant. Um, now, in the interest of saving time, thank you very much. I'm just going to ask a very quick question. If you had all the money you needed, how many years to make this operative in Germany? Maximum 10 years. Oh, better than general, generation four nuclear reactors. <laughs> um, some other questions, unless there are none. The floor is yours. Uh, Greg Offer from Imperial College again. Um, my, I have an interest in this kind of technology. My main question is around um, embedded infrastructure and alternatives. So the main criticism I would have is that this relies on embedded infrastructure. Granted, some may already exist, but to roll this out on a large scale, you'd have to invest in a lot of infrastructure. Um, there are credible alternatives like platooning of existing vehicles, um, which are retrofitable and give you, okay, maybe not all the benefits, but close. So how do you compare to what large number of automotive companies are developing in terms of platooning technology? Mm -hmm. Should I? Yes. Yeah, platooning is obviously somewhat close, but first of all, for platooning, you also have to invest in infrastructure. They don't run on normal roads, right? That's basically, I would say basically impossible because there's so much uh, disturbance by the environment that you can hardly control cars on highways in platooning without doing extra things, like what they talk about is take the middle lane and, and make that special for platooning, things like that. That's, that's number one. Number two is, of course, uh, platooning doesn't really come with the efficiency of this engine, right? And we talk about energy game, game changer tonight, right? And I think that's the key thing, which may be uh, not so clear, but the key thing is really to take that magnetic engine and use it efficiently in such a way that you reuse infrastructure. You have the power with the tracks. I mean, they are in cables above, but it's much easier to put them down rather than to build all this new, new type of things, right? So that makes it competitive which doesn't mean actually that platooning should not be followed on. Actually, I'm fully aware of the situation that actually some German car manufacturers work heavily on platooning and actually were involved even in one of these projects. So it's very familiar for me. I think those are two things which come together or should come together. One last very quick question right here. Tony Curzon Price from Open Democracy. Um, one of the problems we have in UK and a lot of places, a lot of uh, industrialized countries is capacity on the rail system. Does your system, irrespective of the technology, does it increase capacity on a given amount of track? 
I mean, at least you are flexible in terms of you can increase capac capacity easily by basically putting on uh, new caps on the track, right? So you could really adjust your, your amount of cars you run to the capacity you need, which means that you don't need, like in, in, in trains, you basically have to estimate, anticipate what, what, what will come, right? And then Friday trains, Friday afternoon trains in Germany are much longer than, let's say, Wednesday afternoon trains, right? And in some cases it works, in some cases it doesn't work. And of course, with these small cars, you're a lot more flexible, right? And, yeah, so. and it might make it, make it easier to sort of provide services yeah, to small Yeah, it's definitely easier, right, yeah, because you can okay. easily get them from some, let's say, some garage or some, some yeah. storage place and, and, and uh, put, them in, put them on the track. Thank you very much for this probably most sci-fi proposal of a lot. <laughs>